God done with Tulsa? Or can the oil of the Spirit be struck again? Has COVID caught the buckle of the Bible Belt with their pants down? In the middle of the world's darkest hour, Bishop Joseph Castillo of All Nations International Fellowship believes the spirit of revival is here and ready to be poured out on those who fearlessly preach the glorious full gospel of Jesus Christ and refuse to shut their doors. In the middle of this drought, a river is springing forth. The River Church has come to Tulsa by divine mandate and will be opening its doors this summer. Join us at the River of Tulsa at All Nations International Fellowship. This is what the Jews would do. And now you see why the disciples lived with Jesus, walked with Jesus, slept with Jesus. They went with him everywhere he went. This is in Jewish fashion. They would live with the disciples 24 hours a day, walking from place to place, being taught and learning and studying the works of God. That's what it meant to be a disciple. They would discuss and they would memorize scriptures and they would discuss how they could apply them to their lives. This is how they made disciples. It wasn't just always Bible study, but they eat together. They go to a wedding together. They visit a friend for tea together. They would, you know, go to do tasks together, go shopping, pick up the groceries. They just live life together. And to make a disciple of somebody doesn't mean you have to sit with them and give them some religious teaching every week. Matter of fact, most of you guys don't even know what you're talking about yet. You're better off just leave the religious teaching until you get some kind of book or some kind of format to handle. But you can still meet with someone for coffee. You can still take them out shopping. You can still pray with them. You can share with them what you learned on Sunday or share with them a, a, a little verse that you learned. And, and it doesn't have to be so formal like, hey, brother, it's time for our discipleship class. <music> Dust of your rabbi's feet. So the image that we get here is that the person you're discipling would spend so much time with you that as they walk behind you, the dust that's kicked up from your shoes would fall upon their shoes. So everywhere you go, the dust of where you stepped would fall upon their shoes. That's what it meant in the Hebrew to be a disciple. It means you walk so close with. You spent so much time with. You were so close to them that even the dust would fall upon your shoes. That's what it means to be a disciple, and that's what it means to disciple others. I like what one pastor said. He said, nowadays, people don't want to be discipled. They want information. And people come to church for information. They want teachings, doctrines, theologies, sermons, inspiration, but they don't want discipleship. The church, they don't want discipleship in this age. They want to come hear something, learn something, you know, but they don't want to be mentored. They don't want to be discipled. They don't want you to call them up, hey, where were you Sunday? They don't want discipleship. Hey, you're infringing on my private time. They don't want discipleship. But we need to change that, amen. He followed his rabbi so closely, he would walk in the dust. That's why, Acts, let's look at Acts 22.3. This is why you see Paul said this. Acts 22, 3. I am verily a man which is a, which am a Jew, born in Tarsus, a city in Sicilia, yet brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel. This is why I said at the feet of Gamaliel, because everywhere Gamaliel walked, as a disciple, he would walk at his feet, and the dust of Gamaliel's feet would fall upon Paul's feet. This is why he used the term at the feet of Gamaliel. Luke 10, 39, Mary sat at the feet of Jesus. A sign of mature believer is to leave your comfort zone 
for new believers. Amen? Impartation, we think in the Pentecostal world, comes through laying on of hands. Do you think that Paul gave Timothy some cheap impartation through the laying on of hands? Or that Paul or Timothy got an impartation from Eunice and his mother and his grandmother by some cheap laying on of hands? No, the real impartation came through relationship. And the sum of the relationship was the laying on of hands. But the impartation comes through relationship. People want impartation from people they don't even know. They see some pastor on TV, and he says, touch, and people fall down. And they say, oh, man of God, lay hands on me. I want your impartation. And they don't know that that pastor got AIDS because he's sleeping with seven girls in the church. And they want his impartation. It's a zoo. It's a circus more than a church. I want this man's impartation. I don't even know that person. The Bible says, know them that labor among you. I want to know somebody before I get an impartation from them. Can I get an amen in this Pentecostal church? Amen. Impartation comes through relationship and should come through relationship. Why? Because you need to know that person's spirit. Amen. All charismatics know about healing. But how many of us can manifest healing? We all believe that as charismatics that, you know, we can heal the sick. But how many of us manifest healing, can do miracles? Because we don't have discipleship and we don't have relationship. We don't have impartation. We have gotten some teachings and doctrines, but we've never got the substance of it because we don't get discipled and we don't become disciples and we don't have relationship. Therefore, we don't have impartation. If you study even church, the early, I mean, the recent church history from Azusa Street, which I taught about earlier this year, until now, you'll find out that every great man of God had relationship and impartation. Charles Price was with, was with Alexander Dowie. John G. Lake was with Dowie and was with Charles Price. And then they ministered and they were with Maria Woodworth Etter and Catherine Kuhlman was with William Branham. And William Branham was with, you know, uh, F. F. Bosworth. And they all... Throughout the line of all the great Pentecostal, charismatic, Oral Roberts, all of them, all the way down, they all had relationships with each other and impartation. And you could follow it just like dots on a map. Because true impartation comes through relationship. I remember we had our Korean pastor. He asked Bishop Malumba, he said, I pray six hours a day. I pray three hours in the morning from, f from 5 to 8 a.m. Then I pray in the afternoon for three hours. How come I don't have the miracles? And Bishop Malumba told him, if you want to operate in the miracle power of God, you need to be initiated. You have to have impartation. And because you've been under ministries and pastors that don't flow in the supernatural, you can't do it either. There has to be, you have to be initiated into the spirit realm, is what he said. In other words, we, I would say in English, you have to have impartation. And that comes from relationship. Because somebody say amen. amen. A leader is simply, watch this. A leader is simply, simply somebody who does what everyone should do. That's what makes you a leader. How did Eric become a leader? Because he's just pouring coffee and he's vacuuming the floor and he's picking up the pianos and next thing you know, he's a leader. He's just doing what everybody else should be doing. Amen? That's the only difference between a leader and a non-leader is that the leader is doing what we all should be doing. So next thing you know, they start moving up in the kingdom because they're simply doing what every believer should be doing. Amen? You start bringing four or five people to church. You start discipling six, seven, eight people. Next thing you know, you'll be deacon, elder, pastor. Shoot, we'll make you a pastor. Hallelujah. I'll move over to, I'll, I'll move over to Wadalco and you'll be the pastor over there. Is God done with Tulsa? 
Or can the oil of the Spirit be struck again? Has COVID caught the buckle of the Bible Belt with their pants down? In the middle of the world's darkest hour, Bishop Joseph Castillo of All Nations International Fellowship believes the spirit of revival is here and ready to be poured out on those who fearlessly preach the glorious full gospel of Jesus Christ and refuse to shut their doors. In the middle of this drought, a river is springing forth. The River Church has come to Tulsa by divine mandate and will be opening its doors this summer. Join us at the River of Tulsa at All Nations International Fellowship. We're here. Amen. If we begin to do what we're doing, then the kingdom can flourish if we do what we're supposed to do. Amen. 2 Timothy 2.2 2 says this. Let's look at 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. Why are you guys so quiet today? Is it the pollution? Huh? Now listen, I go to other churches. They're shouting. They're running around. They're rolling on the floor, swinging on the chandeliers. <laughs> and you guys are just sitting there. My God. Amen. Second Timothy 2 Timothy 2.2. The things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others. God wants the word of God to be taught to people who will go and teach others. People sometimes laugh about me. Why I always kick people out of the church and stuff and, you know, and all kinds of crazy things. Because I'm not looking for a lot of people. I'm looking for people that are going to live the word, do the word, and manifest the word. Amen. Amen. I'm looking for people that are going to be active in building the kingdom of God and doing things for the Lord. Not just, you know, people that make me feel good about myself because I see many people sitting in the chairs. Amen. I get that through my Facebook likes. Hallelujah. Oh, 5,000 likes. Hallelujah. I feel good about myself. Amen. <laughs> and then if I don't have enough, then I just put, I put some money. Sponsor this post. You know, 50 bucks. Oh, I got a lot of likes there. Hallelujah. I put 50 bucks on to sponsor that like. Amen. No, nah, I'm joking. I, I get my confidence from the Lord. Amen. Amen. Not from how many likes I have on Facebook. <laughs> Hallelujah. And not how many people come to church. I want people that come to any church, and even when I travel. I was just in France, and they brought me to what they call, it's called hell. A pastor named Saeed was a Muslim. He took us there. And this is a place, there's a forest in Paris. And in this forest, there are all these naked women. And they took us there on, a, it was zero degrees. It was raining ice slush, like raining snow slush. And it was zero degrees. It was freezing cold. And I thought there's no way what this guy says is going to happen. Because he said there's thousands of women in the woods, in the forest with no clothes on. And the men just drive up, and they go in the woods, and they have sex with the women, and they come out. And as they're walking there, there was condoms on the floor. I'm walking past condoms, dirty condoms on the floor to go into the forest. And it was disgusting. And I said, surely these women are not going to be out here in the zero degree snow and rain. And then we turned the corner, and all of a sudden, this, I, I guess it was a man actually, with big brown breast. In a, in a pants on or a dress or something, come walking up to the car with a man's face. And we, there was three of us in the car. We were like, ah! Lord, gee, did you see that? And turn, go look. No, 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 look, don't look. You know, like, we weren't sure to say look or don't look. Like, we, you know, 
And then we turn another corner, boom, there was like 20 of them. And turn another corner, boom, another 30 of them, there 50 of them. There are women everywhere with, with their breast out, no clothes on, standing in the ice cold naked, prostituting their bodies. And the pastor told us, the Christians don't come here. Nobody comes here to preach to these women. He said, only the Catholics come twice a year. The little nuns. Little sweet, you know, nuns come, you know, twice a year to, to just, you know, give some bread to these prostitutes. I said, what? The, none of the Christians come to minister to these women? I said, they're here every night? He said, every night, summer, winter, these women are out here naked, prostituting themselves every night, and not one church comes here to preach to them. Then we went over to the refugees, and we began to preach to the refugees because there's thousands of refugees in Paris. And we went into the park where all the refugees were sleeping in the cold with just the kids and everything, they're sleeping on the floor in the cold. And I began to pray, and we led two Muslims to Christ, a husband and wife. She got healed. and her, She had a bad back, and she got healed, and then they both got saved. They only speak Farsi, but the husband knew some English, so I preached to them. And I went to the churches to preach. And I asked all the churches, how many of you guys have been out to preach to the refugees? Not one Christian in none of the churches I went to said they went to preach to the refugees. I said, well, how many of you guys been out to the prostitutes in the forest? Not one of the Christians went ever to preach to the prostitutes in the forest. And then I said, how many of you guys even know about these prostitutes in the forest? And all the women were like, I never heard of it. And the guys were like, I better not say, you know. <laughs> you know. <laughs> the church, these Christian people are going to church sometimes three, four times a week. And they are not doing anything that Jesus told them to do. And these women are right there in their city. And these refugees are right there in their city. And the church, the Christians are just coming and just having church. So you know what? I did this. I, I was about ready to kick them all out. I said, if I was the pastor, I'd kick you all out. But I'm not the pastor. Bishop Malumba is. Amen. Well, what, what's the purpose of the church? For us to hear another cute sermon? Bishop Hagen, Kenneth Hagen said, there's so many things that Jesus has showed me, but he's never, he, he don't allow me to preach it. He said, because I won't let you preach it until the church begins to do what I've already told them to do. Until they begin to do what I've already told them to do, I don't want you to bring this fresh revelation that, I, that I've told you. We always want a fresh word, but we don't even want to forgive our neighbor because they asked us out on a date. Hey, stop scrolling right now because we have an exciting announcement to make to you. We have powerful teachings and preaching and encouraging words that will change your life. And it's all on our YouTube channel, Living Proof TV. So come down, go to our YouTube channel, watch all the great content episodes we have. You will not be disappointed. Revelation, teaching, preaching, authority in the word of God. You're going to be inspired. You're going to be encouraged. And you're going to be ready to give the devil a black eye. God has promised that in these last days, his ministers shall possess greater power. in the church. We need to repent and we need to reevaluate our lives. Do we have disciples? And if not, we need to ask God to forgive us for not being a disciple and commit to be a disciple and commit to make disciples. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. I was so blessed to be outside with those prostitutes. I was so blessed. I felt so much joy to pray with those refugees and to see the wife healed. 
I had $400 in my pocket. My wife gave me $400. Four $100 bills. And she said, this is for you for the next two weeks in London and Paris. Our first day in Paris was 150 euros in Uber just to get around. She leaves me with $400. This is not enough in Europe. But as I'm sitting there talking to these husband and wife that have fled Iran and they're sleeping on the street, I said, I don't care if I only have $400. They need it more than me. And I took out $100 and I gave it to the men. I said, here, this is for you. It's not a lot, but here, give them $100. I only had three left. I was like, oh, Jesus. God, I'm gonna shut that. <laughs> Then he tells me about his wife's back. He shows me the medicine. I pray for her. She gets healed. After she gets healed, she's praising God. She threw off her blankets, took off her gloves. She's praising God. And she starts saying in Farsi, she starts, <laughs> in Farsi. And then the husband starts yelling at her. <laughs> And I said, what's going on? He said, she didn't tell me. I said, she didn't tell you what? That He said, this morning, Jesus appeared to her in a dream. And Jesus, about five in the morning, she was ice cold freezing, getting numb all over her body. And she had a, he called him Esau, Esau. He said, Esau appeared to her with his hands out like this. And Esau appeared to her with his hands out to her, and he spoke to her, and her whole body got warm. And the numbness and the pain left her body. And he's like, why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you tell me? He's yelling at her, why didn't you tell me? He said, this is the first time I'm hearing this too. And I said, well, Esau didn't come to you one time today. He came to you two times today. First he came himself. Now he's sending his messenger. To say that the Esau that came to you with his hands out, he was coming to you to tell you, come to me. Allah has not answered your prayers, but he is God. Jesus is God, and he will hear and answer your prayers. And he will come into your heart, and he will take care of you. And the, both of these Iranian people gave their life to Jesus with me. Amen. Amen. And I took out another hundred. I said, oh, man, here. Here's another hundred. Here's one for you, one for your wife. And I gave her the other hundred. And the whole way back, I was praising God and I was regretting. Have you guys ever heard of giver's remorse? I had giver's remorse because I only had 400 bucks. Now I got two. And I got seven days in Europe. And I had giver's remorse. And I go to have dinner, and this pastor walks up to me and gives me $100. And I said, thank you, Lord. It's not two, but it's one. I receive it. Thank you, Lord. Then I wake up in the morning, and I got a message, email. Somebody who doesn't know me, doesn't have me. I mean, they know me, but they don't have my Facebook. They don't have my Instagram. They don't know what I did. They went to their church, and they sent their church $1,000 to so give this to that guy, Joey, in China. And I woke up with $1,000 in my account. Amen. You see, you can't outgive God. If you would really make your priority to, to, to make disciples of, of the lost and to help others and to give sacrificially, God will take care of you. Amen. And he will bless you. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for today's conclusion of this understanding of making disciples. And we, Father God, understand that these were your very last words. So important that you, like, so important that you even got up from the dead to tell us this. And we, Father God, have just, just, just this with so many other things, but, but this is the most important thing you could ever say. We have just left it to the wayside to have a type of Christianity that was cookie cut from institutionalized religion and not a Christianity that's actually making disciples of those around us. Jesus, we ask you to forgive us right now. Just repent. It was me too before. 
And I repented. And I would need you to repent too. Just repent to the Lord for that. And ask God today to help you to reach out to people. Just like Nellie is reaching out to that Mongolian girl and just going to have coffee with her hanging out. Just reach out to people. Have coffee with them. Take them shopping. Be their friend. And let the love of Christ soak through you to them. And make disciples of all nations. Jesus will help you to do it. Just repent. Acknowledge Acknowledge where you're weak in this area and commit to God today to make a change that you're going to be a disciple of Jesus and you're going to make disciples. You're going to sacrifice from your time to give to others that what you have in Jesus Christ. Father God, we ask you today to, Father God, not let this message just just be another message that we've heard, Father God, but let it be a, a, a paradigm shift in our thinkings, in our beliefs, and our worldviews that would shift us to action, we pray. In the name of Jesus. And Father God, we thank you for this today and we give you praise for it. In Jesus' name, somebody say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Hey, Bishop Joseph Castillo here, and I trust you were blessed and encouraged, but you only got an appetizer, a little hors d'oeuvre. I'm just wetting your appetite. The entire message will be available at quarantinechurch.com. So if you go to the website and you register at Quarantine Church, you'll have access to today's teaching, plus the entirety of it, and the whole series, the archives, and everything that we're doing in this particular series, and I trust it will bless you. And when the quarantine's over, you might not have a church like this in your town or your city, but you'll still belong to this fellowship. A Quarantine Church is a member. You'll get Zoom calls, personal prayer times, personal ministry, prophetic healing, intercession. Be part of an online community here at Quarantine Church. And we're going to be posting new videos constantly every day, every couple days, whatever. That's going to all be on YouTube. So make sure you subscribe and click the little bell icon there. So this way you'll get a jingle or a message every time we upload a new video. Thanks for watching. I trust you're blessed. I love you. It's so